So a few years ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to Japan, and while we were there, we visited the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum, which is actually where the shirt's from. And on this shirt, you can see one of the first outlines made for one dinosaur that comes from Japan, Fukui Venator, or the Fukui Hunter because it's from the Fukui Prefecture. And when you look at this outline, you can see it's pretty generic as far as most Solurosaurian theropods go, in that it's fairly lightly built and honestly somewhat similar to many of the dromaeosaurs, so things like Velociraptor or Deinonychus. However, a new study looked at these bones, including some of the first authors who actually did find this animal, and they came to an entirely different conclusion. It's still a Solurosaur, but the earliest most of a very strange group of Solurosaurs, the Therizinosaurs. And looking at this skeletal reconstruction, it's pretty generic and falls in line with a lot of the other Solurosaurs as being lightly built and probably at least somewhat carnivorous, although the authors at that time did note that it did have some peg-like teeth, which were probably used for eating plants rather than meat. However, some of the more forward teeth were a little bit more serrated and probably used for catching meat. So it was likely an omnivore. As for its genetics, they really couldn't narrow it down because it was found in a polytomy, which just means that each of the branches coming off of this line are all equally likely to be split up in any combination that keeps them all there, but just some closer to the others. So it's really, really inconclusive what it was. So a new group of authors came in and looked at these bones and actually CT scanned all of them. And what they came to was actually a different conclusion because they felt like they could place it at least fairly accurately. And not with any of the groups it plotted close to in that first paper on Fukui Venator, but rather, it plotted much closer and actually as the very first member of the Therizinosaurs. And the Therizinosaurs were some of the most bizarre theropod dinosaurs that there were. Now, as the name does suggest, Fukui Venator was probably still hunting at least some of the time, especially with those serrated teeth I mentioned. And when you look at other Therizinosaurs, this means there needed to be a major body plan shift from Fukui Venator into the later Therizinosaurs, because some of the later ones were built very different and only eight plants. And as for hypothetical reconstructions of Fukui Venator's actual body plan, Gabriel, as always, made an incredibly, incredibly great illustration with hypothetical throat pouches, but it's still probably more or less what Fukui Venator would have been like in life, a fairly moderate-sized omnivore, which as we'll get into, a lot of that needed to change. So for those who aren't aware, the Therizinosaurs are a strange group of theropods, and theropods in general are the two-legged, meat-eating types of dinosaurs. So think of things like Tyrannosaurus rex or Velociraptor. So the Therizinosaurs were a pretty big departure from this, because they evolved a couple of features that we don't really see in most of the other theropods. For example, they had very large claws, very visible in animals like Nothernicus and Therizinosaurus, and they probably used these in order to help pull tree branches closer to their mouths. But they also evolved a relatively small head as well as peg-shaped teeth to help strip leaves from branches. So they were very, very unique among the theropods in becoming entirely herbivorous, although this did happen a few other times. But they could also get very big. For example, here's where I am next to the Nothernicus skeleton that's on display at the Museum of Northern Arizona in Flagstaff. And Nothernicus, compared to Therizinosaurus, is much smaller with Therizinosaurus being almost twice as tall and nearly 40 feet long, or about 12 meters. So that also means that there had to be a massive size change from Fukui Venator to some of these later Therizinosaurs, because Fukui Venator was not very large. And even in the first paper, they acknowledged this, with the scale bar for the entire skeletal being only about half a meter, or around a foot and a half. So despite its small stature, it does seem like Fukui Venator was still a Therizinosaur, and you can tell this based at least on some features of the skull, which unfortunately isn't complete, but at least with those teeth I mentioned, you can see some of the specific features, such as the peg-like teeth, starting to evolve and helping the animal process more plant material. But there was other stuff that the CT scans really helped to illuminate, because they were also able to scan the brain case and understand the shape of the brain. Now, in reptiles in general, they have a much tighter brain case, which means you can understand where different features of the skull actually were, and essentially how they would have grown. This means researchers were able to see different parts of the brain, and understand some different features about it, such as how the animal smelled, and it probably smelled pretty good. Not like it smelled good, but that it was good at smelling. I mean, I don't know, maybe it did smell good. 
Like, it maybe it just smelled nice. I don't know. But it could at least smell itself smelling nice if it did, because it had a very well-developed olfactory sense, meaning it could smell very, very well, and this is something we found in basically every Therizinosaur that we've scanned in this way. And that means it might be a synapomorphy of the group. Uh, synapomorphy just meaning that it's a feature that is found in all members of the group. It's something that we can use to help define if a new fossil does belong to this group. Now, there were other dinosaurs which also had a good sense of smell. For example, Tyrannosaurus rex famously had a very good sense of smell, but didn't have some of the other features that it seems like Therizinosaurs did have. For example, based on Fukui Venator, they likely had a Pyga style. And pyga styles are actually really important for understanding the evolution of feathers. Because what a pyga style is, it's a series of bones at the end of the tail of the animal, which allows the entire tail to be covered in feathers. So if you think of modern bird feathers, where there's not a distinctive V in those tail feathers, that's because of a pyga style, which lets those feathers grow off the tip of the tail very evenly. Whereas in dromaeosaurs, which still had complex feathers, but didn't have pygostyles, styles, there is a very distinctive V on their tail feathers. Now, the implications that this has for the evolution of feathers within the dinosaurs is that it was probably being used as a display structure with a lot of large, long feathers coming off of the tail, rather than just the kind of simple downy feathers that you might expect. So you'd probably be expecting something much broader and potentially almost peacock-like, although probably not to that same massive extent, coming off the tail of Fukui Venator and eventually even some of the later Therizinosaurs. This also means that those feathers would have been veined and more like flight feathers. Now, Fukui Venator still would have been too large to fly, but it does mean that in some other groups that were after this, they would have already had these kinds of more veined and asymmetric feathers which do lead to flight in some of the later groups that started to diverge. Now, there has also been some evidence that the ornithomimids may have also had these kinds of complex feathers, and within the phylogeny that's given in this paper, the ornithomimosaurs split earlier, and that evidence isn't that strong, which means that we can at least probably say, at least for some level of certainty, that at least therizinosaurs and the other branches that split off in this phylogeny at least those ones had complex feathers. Maybe they existed in ornithomimosaurs, but we just don't have distinctive enough fossils yet. As for the overall phylogeny, there's a couple things here that I think are interesting, but those are going to have to wait for papers that were at least somewhat discussed at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting this past November, and those papers are specifically on Ornitholestes and on Lepisaurus. So hopefully those will get published soon. So Kimmy Chappelle and Victor Rodermacher really hoping you'll get on it, because those two papers sound really exciting, and I think combined with this paper, all of those different data points for the solarosaurs together will help us to really understand what these animals were doing.